Hello, this is Jerry Orr reporting for the Art Station, and right now we are with Terrell Whitlatt. She is a creature designer. She has done amazing work for a lot of great films, including Star Wars Episode One: Phantom Menace. And not only that, she has done work for Brother Bears, Brave, and so much more. She's also published many books. We're going to jump into all of that and talk about all of that. But Terrell, what fascinates me so much about your experience and your career is that you had a zoological training. You had a scientific training in the way creatures live and the way creatures move and how we categorize creatures. You know, if people go to your art station account, they'll find paleontological drawings you've done. You have such a strong academic background, but you're working in such an artistic field. Do you believe that having this scientific background is crucial to the art you do? I would say so, um, especially in the realm of creature design. Um, particularly now, since we are getting, especially if you have more C, CG platforms, more realistic um, you, you, can, you can get. And to uh, um, the extent where I was looking at um, the episode of the, the latest season of The Crown, and there is this beautiful red deer stag that is spectacularly realistic but it is a digital stag. And I had to look twice to say, whoa. Um, and I was saying, thank heavens it's a digital stag because it was the subject of a hunting adventure and I didn't want a real one animal to be harmed. So I, <laughs> but I was very relieved that there are digital animals that can uh, stand in. And so having a scientific background to clue into the details as to what makes a particular animal itself is crucial. Um, and uh, just even in general, how animals locomote, even if you're doing a very exaggerated or stylized character, you still need to have that basic anatomical knowledge in order to animate it in a believable sense so that your audience won't be saying, that's a weird thing that doesn't quite work instead of paying attention to the movie or the production. So. Mm. You know, uh, what I find really interesting about what you're saying about uh, the movement of the creatures is that in a lot of lectures and a lot of classes, and there's a lot of them online, if our audience wants mm -hmm. to check them out, you know, you've granted a lot of resources to people who are learning, but you talk a lot about giving the creatures soul, you know, mm -hmm. in a way almost anthropomorphizing them, you know, giving them personalities. It's something that it's, it's very anthropomorphic, but it's also natural. You know, our pets have personalities and you talk Ew. a lot about giving those to the creatures you design. But can you talk a little bit about your process? You know, you have this drawing of a character. How does this drawing have personality? Well, um, when a drawing has that inner life, you know, you're, you're creating an illusion of life, basically. And when that drawing has an inner life, something that imbues it from the inside out, we can relate to it. As you mentioned, we can relate to our pets because they respond to back to us and in many cases reflect what we're feeling. Um, and it's really interesting. I think Jane Goodall brought, broke a lot of backgrounds when she did her research with the chimpanzees and other animals. She basically accepted what was there, what was instead of trying to put it into a box and say, oh, it's just basic instinct. She was say, actually saying, excuse me, these animals have personalities, they have modus operandi, and, and, and they know one another, from, you know, can tell each other apart, there's different idiosyncrasies, and we know that just from, even if, even if you have goldfish, goldfish as individuals will act differently. And so in order to create a story going forward, we need to be able to relate to those animals, um, in a, in a very in a very real sense and uh, that's what's so important that's what's so very important otherwise why why engage <laughs> so well said so well said now for some projects you took this a step further like for star wars episode one phantom menace if people looked at the drawings you made for that the designs you made for that uh you also illustrated people well, creatures who take up roles in society like for example mm -hmm. the pod racer drivers you know yeah. these aren't just creatures with personalities these are people with jobs, mm -hmm. with uh, careers, with mm -hmm. dreams and aspirations, they have very much more human thoughts. So how do you kind of add to that, you know, putting them in a society and in, in a background? Because you also, for more, you know, standard wildlife, you, st you still put your creatures in a background, in an environment that they interact with. What's your process for that? 
Well, you know, we have our models as ourselves, you know, human society and all that entails civilizations, which we, it always exposes our, our motives, whether good or ill at the very basic level. And so that's where I start, you know, for a creature, um, well, like in the Star Wars I'm, I'm, or Star Trek universe for that, for that matter, I've never worked on a Star Trek production, but it's similar in that you've got this universe which allows for non-human people, as you're saying, non-humanoid people. And so, for example, with a fun character like Sebulba, I mean, I thought about what is his base motive? Well, his base motive is he wants to win. He just wants to win and then enjoy luxuriating in the afterglow of the win. That's his high. And uh, it doesn't matter how he achieves that as long as he does. And so I think about, yeah, there are people that unfortunately in this world that are that are rather like that <laughs> and uh, and so it's it is fun though to play around with those characters you think about what are their motives why do they behave the way they do what is it that they want and what they, do they value and we need look no longer no farther afield than ourselves to to do that um, i think one of the best creature designers of all time who was able to do that well was of, of all people dr seuss we think of the cat in the hat or the Grinch or the, the Who's or whatever it was. I mean, these are very non-human creatures that, you know, they've got definitely have a backstory. It's so interesting that, you know, you're talking about it as if coming from a writer's background. It's like writing a backstory for these characters that you are designing in the flesh. It's so interesting how their stories are seen visually. But I want to cross into your specific style as an artist a little bit more because what I really love about your drawings is how colorful they are. You know, your your creatures are so, so very vibrant in color. So can you talk a little bit about your process, not only in designing, you know, the shape and the contour and the mm -hmm. uh, personality of them, but the color as well? Well, I take my cues from nature, what exists on this planet. And again, one reason is because that's what we as human beings get excited about. When you look at, you go to the zoo, you go to Costa Rica or wherever you are, and you see this beautiful parrot flying through the trees. I mean, that's exciting. It's such got such beautiful colors. And then it's it just, there's something extremely magical about it or birds of paradise or Siamese fighting fish, you know, whatever it is, uh, it, there's just, it's just so exciting. And then when you think about an, a creature in its natural environment, how do those colors help it survive? Is it um, simply to hide or is it to show off like, you know, a peacock? I mean, that's a gorgeous bird that's really not designed for camouflage. Or what about zebras? I mean, they are just right out there. There's nothing really more dazzling than a, a herd of a group of zebras running across the plains. It's very, very exciting to see. Beautiful, you know, poetry in motion. So <laughs> very much so, very much so. Now, yeah. you talked in previous interviews about the importance, you believe, of studying, like you said, nature, you know, going to the zoos, looking at animals. Now, hopefully we'll be able to go back to zoo soon enough. But right now, uh -huh. because of COVID, we are not able to do that. So what suggestions would you give for finding inspiration when right now the safest thing to do is stay at home? Well, if you can, if you can get out and, you know, walk in the park, if you get into nature that way where you're, you know, socially distanced far enough um, from other people, that would be a good thing to do. And of course, being stuck at home or in the house, we can go to um, various um, places on the internet. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can go to Netflix or PBS, you know, online, uh, wherever it is. And there's always beautiful nature documentaries. And for example, on PBS, just, you know, the nature series, you can watch that. You can pause it, you know, and um, sketch from the video and then let it go and then sketch some more. But the cinematography and the photography now that's capable in modern wildlife video is outstanding and you can get so excited and and so close up that i would definitely recommend video sources um the latest david attenborough um productions are just exquisite just exquisite i completely agree and 
it really, uh, you know, connects to what we're talking about in designing creatures. You know, seeing these creatures in a documentary allows us to connect with them, see the personalities in them, seeing how they're unique, how they're just individuals in themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny how it all connects together at the uh, mm -hmm. end of the day. Now, I'd like to shift a little bit more towards your career. So you've worked on both live action films like Star Wars Phantom Menace, which did it through puppetry, visual effects. And you've mm -hmm. also worked on fully animated films like yes. Brave for example. So can you talk a little bit about what the difference is, you know, because they are very different workflows. What exactly yes. is the differences between the two mediums? Well, they all, all of them, of course, have a projection schedule. And as a conceptual illustrator, myself, my colleagues are kind of at the top of that pyramid. Um, because what we do dictates how the, the feature is put together. And so that in a way that kind of dictates the production schedule. So the faster and more comprehensively we work, the easier it is down, down the line all the way to post-production. Um, with live action, we are basically designing a character that will be inserted into particular scenes, but not perhaps throughout the entire movie. Although with Star Wars, there were so many digital characters in, in most of the scenes that it started to border on a traditional animated feature like Brother Bear or, or as you say, Bla um, Brave. Um, so there, there's, a, there's a lot of crossover um, where there might be a little bit of differentiation, maybe more in the nature of the production. Is this a digitally animated production? Is this a mix of digital and practical effects? Um, or is it an entirely, um, let's say, Judy uh, production? At the fundamentals, designing for either is about the same. You're still using the same anatomical platforms, the same principles of animation and locomotion. Um, however, with a production like Star Wars, I had to get very, very detailed as far as providing industrial light and magic in this case, what they needed. So after the design was approved, whether it was, you know, Jar Jar, the Aquasando monster, or, you know, say Sebulba and, and, and company, I had to then step back and design the skeleton and complete muscular systems from four different angles to be sent to industrial light and magic for them to model and to rig the character because they needed to know, you know, not only how long is it, how wide is it, where do these skeletons articulate? And once you, if you give them that basic information, then here it is on a plate, nice for them to just take off because time and labor, that adds up to, to budget and the more seamless you can keep that, the more information from the get-go you can give your production team the better and easier it is for everybody so that's um, fascinating that's absolutely yeah. fascinating you know i love that this idea that you know you're designing the muscles and the skeletons it's not just for you to design the creature but it's used across all of the production like the entire yeah. production wants to make sure it's clear this is a creature that could exist you know yeah. with an anatomy and, a, and biology this is a creature that we're not just making in our minds in our dreams mm -hmm. this is a creature that we could see in the real world that's absolutely yeah. fascinating. Well, you know, like the charm of Star Wars, at, I think at the, its basic level, in all aspects, you know, the environments, the vehicles, the creatures, it's, they echo what we already know, mm -hmm. actually very strongly. So we can picture ourselves going there. We can, and we love that because we think we could, we kind of know what tattooing looks like because there's places in the world from the Mojave Desert to the Sahara that looks like tattooing. We, we like Bonthus because they're like giant horned woolly mammoths. You know, we like those or, and muskox stuck together. We like those because we can relate to that. And even bizarre animals like, you know, Sebulba, I mean, he was based on a dromedary camel of all things. If you look at his head, it's this weird camel head. So. <laughs> That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit more about the paleontolo paleontological reconstructions I mentioned earlier. You uh -huh. said in another interview that you believe, you know, paleontological reconstruction creature design, they're very connected uh, art forms, very connected mediums. Can you talk a little bit more about that, you know, how they're connected? Yes. Uh, so with paleontological reconstructions, which is basically 
creating, recreating, recreating ex an extinct species in most cases, or, you know, it could be a tree or, or, or something else that was alive. We have to look at the closest living relatives and draw inferences. We may have more or less complete skeletons, usually less. And so we've got bone fragments, but those bone fragments usually have what are called muscle scars on them. And so we try to, as paleontologists and paleo artists try to discern what is the closest relative to these, these animals. And then based on the living creature, the living animal, um, interpolate what the prehistoric animal looked like. You know, examples would be looking at living elephants to determine what does a woolly mammoth look like. And there's many other types of mammoths and mastodons besides the woolly mammoth. There's there's a lot of other ones, but we we look at that, and it could be in you know, or else you know, reconstructing a Neanderthal um, person. We look at modern day people. Um, and it goes on. I'm, I, I'm just finished a book with a paleontologist about um, ter flying creatures. And there's a lot of paleont paleontology in, that we discuss and, and illustrate um, pterodactyls, including um, some of the latest findings in pterodactyls. And they're bizarre, bizarre animals, but yet the reptiles and their skeletons reflect their reptilian um, origins and yeah, they're they're very complicated, interesting animals. Um, but there's enough similarities and consistencies in, in among vertebrates to be able to um, more or less accurately draw inferences. We won't know ever know exactly you know what they look like as far as coloration and unless we find mummified versions of you know even skin texture. But we can get it fairly close, you know, fairly close. Yeah, it really is like just seeing how creative a science is and how scientific an art is. It, mm -hmm. It's just such a blurry boundary between the two. Now, you mentioned yeah. you're working on a new book, and I think that's a great segue to the books you've made in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. You've made several books just about designing creatures, like uh, the principles of uh, creature design, the science of creature design. You've also done books that are more narrative, more fictional, like, am I saying this right, The Katerian Odyssey? The Katurin Odyssey, yes. The Katurin Odyssey. I saw some samples of that. It's beautiful, beautiful work. Can you talk a little bit about the process oh. behind that and the origin story behind that? Oh, yes. Well, thank you very much. And I'm really happy that it has been re recently republished. So that's really fun. The Katurin Odyssey um, takes place on a Earth-like planet. And it, this planet is called Katura. And it's inhabited entirely by animals. And these animals could be any animal that existed on planet Earth, whether they're extinct or concurrent right now. And they um, can understand each other's languages more or less. And they all have their own dialects, but there's they are true to their natures. If you're a predator, you're a predator animal. If you're you know, a prey animal, you're a prey animal. It's not like the circle of life. It's not like we all get along, we're happy. <laughs> It's, it's not it's not like that. It's more like the Wild West. And I first got the idea as um, the Phantom Menace was coming to completion. And, you know, there was so much world building for that production. So I learned a lot about world building and I had an idea for one of my own worlds. So let's, you know, let's, let's kind of follow George's lead and have a, a, a planet that we can envision and relate to. And when you only have animals as opposed to human beings in there, you open yourself up for a lot more possibilities without offending anybody. <laughs> you can talk about war, you can talk about other things like that, things that are, are hotbeds, but animals are involved and not people. And it's kind of like what Aesop did by disguising what he wanted to say in terms of animal characters. And so basically what the Katurin Odyssey is about, it's about this little lemur who something very terrible and almost supernatural happens to him, this, this, this event that causes him to be different. It's not his fault, but then the other lemurs and he's kicked out and he goes on this big adventure and he eventually 
finds his way back home and brings salvation to his island home. But that's the, the basic story arc. But all along the way, it's, it's the adventures he has and the relationships that he makes. And we deal with you know, prejudice. We deal with animals that are, you know, are, have nefarious motives. Obviously, these are human um, 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 motives you know, involved. But needless to say, it, it was just a really fun, fun grand adventure. And I was able to be as colorful or as dark as, as I wanted to be. And so that's, that's how Katura started. And uh, I was really happy when George Lucas endorsed the book. So that made me really, really happy. Mm -hmm. Well, for our audience, make sure to check it out. It's available. You know, Terrell just said it just got republished. So check out the book and check out her other books as yeah. well. Now, uh, Terrell, you've been working in this industry when it's been changing quite a lot, because just for example, since the Phantom Menace came out, uh, drawing tools have been, revolutionized you know oh, yeah. you can of course draw on paper of course you know, that's never going to go away but you can now draw on tablets you can draw on laptops you can draw on phones even if someone yeah, ever wants can. to try that uh, <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about you know what your perspective is and how these changes in the industry has impacted your way of making art well i think it's all wonderful and you know there's always a learning curve in learning something new regardless of what the application is for example i've you know, started out very much as a traditional artist because that's all that there was available. When I was in art school way back in the olden days of yours, which would have been like, you know, the 80s, you, you know, I'm really, really old. It, that's all there was, was pen, pencil and paper and acrylics and markers. And even at, at ILM in the 90s, that's primarily what we used. The fastest way of, of getting any kind of media across with either acrylic paint or um, markers and markers were, were just actually not as great as it became later on with the Copic markers and high level markers of that end. And uh, so then with digital, it was kind of, um, you kind of gradually transfer over there. You kind of get your feet wet and, and start playing around with it. And of course it was Photoshop, which was the big, you know, kahuna and, and it still is. I mean, I've played around in Procreate and such, and and it's and which is similar and wonderful. Um, but uh, I tend to find myself doing a combination of working both digitally and traditionally. I find I like the combination of the chaos factor that traditional media brings in, but then there's a nice cleanup and and special effects and stuff like that with the digital. So I kind of will often smooge them together. I'll use often start drawing traditionally and then scan it into Photoshop or whatever, and then play around with it. It depends, but I like getting kind of that, that half and half mixture. You know, there's a little bit of stuff I can't quite control with the digital and yet there's the convenience of, Ooh, I can, I want to do that over again. Like let's, let's fix that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, control Z on digital that saved my life. So many times. The human's greatest invention is Control Z, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah, the, the, what, the digital eraser, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Delete. Now, <laughs> now uh, for people who want to get into conceptual design in general, whether it be creature design, environmental design, uh, conceptual design, what tips would you give them for developing that type of imagination, that type of ability to really be the first one to put it on paper, to put ideas onto paper? Well... I would say hone your observational skills of the real world, of the world around you, you know, people, human behavior, animals, and be, stay curious, stay informed. I would say try to become a Renaissance person. Be interested in the sciences, be interested in stories, read a lot, read a lot, and look at the world as it is, not as you wish it to be. Because when you look at what's real, then you can start to have adventures and then you can use your imagination. When you're looking at, at the world, say, as in, with a preconceived platform, then that limits you. It's like um, not looking at nature in order to do, to do creature designs. If you do that, then all your creature designs start to look alike, I have found. Um, but if, you, if, you, why, if you're widely read, you read both fiction and nonfiction, you, you know, the classics of fiction, you know, you know um, 
from winning, let's say, Lord of the Rings to Moby Dick to Jane Austen, all of that stuff feeds into your psyche. Uh, if you look at what's going on in science from subatomic you know, um, um, physics, which is fascinating to astronomy, to biology, all of that, all these things will play into your ability to design. They absolutely will be. I, I'm a huge believer in becoming as educated as you can. Um, and there's so much information out there. Um, I say, seek out the truth and seek out um, what heritage we have in the humanities and the sciences. You know, I think the work definitely, I mean, the work you put in, you know, uh, broadening yourself, it definitely shows in your final work, in your final art. Now, we are running long time, but I just want to ask you, so this definitely, I would imagine, happens with you, and I'm guessing it happens with a lot of artists, is knowing when it's done. Because, for example, with your work, it's mm -hmm. so, so detailed. I mean, of course, we're talking about the muscle and skeletal systems, mm -hmm. but if you just look at any of your artworks, the details in the fur and the skin and the hair or uh, whatever the creature has, it's always very, very small, very minute. So when do you know to, to put down the paper and say, this creature is done at least for now? Uh, that can be a hard one because the temptation is to get into a zone of noodle, 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 noodle. It's kind of like autopilot, you know, you know and you got to find out, okay, this is enough because if I add too much more detail, it's going to get in the way of what I want people to be looking at. Like I want, if I want people to focus in on the face of the creature, um, I'm going to put more detail around the face of it rather than the rest of rest of the body. Um, if you, I think the thing is, is too much detail can muddy the water. So if the extra detail is starting to obscure the creature, the animal, then it's, it's time to stop. And I would say in a lot of my most recent design work, I am focusing more on the big picture of the animal and more of a graphic um, design um, aspect as opposed to focusing on the minutiae. Now, if of course, you know, a client wants highly, highly detailed stuff, you know, I, I will do that. Um, but drawing for myself, I'm trying to say, okay, what's just enough and what is going to be too much? What can, what, how little can I get away with? And I think it's interesting as an artist matures, I think younger, as you're a younger artist, you tend to add more, keep more detail in there. As you mature, you think, okay, what can I leave out? Now, if you're doing scientific illustration, well, by definition, you may have to keep a lot of detail in there. But for one's own pleasure, I think, well, you know, what can I, if I'm going to be an illustrator, but using some more graphic design, what can I get away with? I mean, I, I like that people like, you know, Alphonse Mucha, beautiful drawings, but he didn't necessarily keep everything in there. So what can I leave out and still have the overall picture that I want? But that just comes with editing. <laughs> it definitely also sounds like it comes with experience of knowing, you know, how the viewer will react to the art, knowing what they'll their eyes will be drawn to, knowing yeah. where else you can kind of, you know, skip away, let yeah. that be a little bit undone, which is, you know, right. fascinating because it's just another science. It's the science of psychology coming into play mm -hmm. when designing mm -hmm. creatures. But that is all the time we have. Terrell, thank you so much for talking to us today. Oh, you're so welcome. My pleasure. For our audience, make sure to check out Terrell's many books and many artworks we talked about. Make sure to check out artstation.com. Terrell's works are up there. They are beautiful to see, really incredible, and so many artists are on Artstation to check out. There's also an Artstation podcast. There are interviews. There are articles all at artstation.com. You can find the link in the description below. I'm your host, Jerry Orr, signing off. Bye.